Please. For the late comers, I have started a meeting on Teams just to, so you can see what I'm doing because I don't have a data show and I'm finishing the analysis on the document I have started last time. So in order for you to see what I'm doing on the document, you have to go, you have to join the team and you will see everything. Well, if you don't have it, you're going to find the video recorded. I have already started the recording and the document is going to be uploaded later. Um, uh, uh, both on Facebook and on Teams. Okay? Also on YouTube. On your channel on YouTube. Yes, I can also uh, upload it on YouTube. All right. So this was all for the characterization. For the latecomers, I'm going to read what we have written together. Uh, the text includes two main characters, which are Robinson being the protagonist and the waves, in this case, acting like antagonist because they almost killed him. Robinson is a round character because in the text, different sides of his personality are exposed. Uh, he is also lifelike and he feels uh, as he feels and displays normal human feelings. He is the first, he is first happy to arrive to the mainland. He is almost hysterical for finding out that he was finally saved from death. He is also anxious and scared because everyone else had died at sea. He is worried about dying from hunger or being devoured by the beast. Did you get it? ideas, the general ideas. Okay. All right. So the next thing we're going to speak about is going to be the uh, uh, the plot overview. Uh, you know, when we're talking about the plot, we're talking about the uh, the uh, the development of events. Yes, the events will start from a first conflict and then they will develop uh, in order to reach a climax and then resolve. Now. Um, how would the plot begin in your in your uh, in your opinion? Yes. In the first of the stories. Yes. The conflict with the problem. Hello. How are you? Hi, are you? Okay. Thank you. We have well analyzing Robinson Crusoe here. So the plot that I asked about is the plot of the text that you were provided from Robinson Crusoe. Okay. So. Uh, what? How does the plot begin in the excerpt? Yes. Yes, I know it begins with the conflict. I want you to tell me which conflict it is. Yes. Yes. Sorry. He was a truck on an island. Uh huh. He was stuck uh, at sea. Uh huh. Come on. Okay, let's go back to the uh, to the general ideas. We said the excerpt includes many ideas related to Robinson's survival. It's, it first explains that Robinson and his companions were thrown out of the ship during the storm, which refers to uh, which he refers to when he says the raging wave uh, came and swallowed up in the morning uh, in one moment. Uh, the reader also learns that Robinson lost all his companions and his ship 
uh, from sight. Robinson fought the waves for survival. Uh, in the second paragraph, the reader learns that Robinson almost died because he took uh, a lot of water and he was trying to use uh, all his breath. So if we were to, um, to, to, to describe or to explain the plot development, these are the things that we are going to speak about. First, when you are talking about the plot development, you have to stick to the plot of the excerpt that was provided to you. You do not speak about the entire plot of the entire novel, okay? You have to stick to the plot of the excerpt that was provided to you. So, we were to talk about the conflict in this uh, in this plot. Well, there does not be. Yes, when the boat was uh, was uh, was overset. Okay, so the plot begins when the boat is wrecked, and Robinson, yes, and his companions are thrown at sea. Okay, what else? How does it develop? Okay. Yes, how did he survive? We are talking about how the events actually develop. How do the events become more serious? Sorry? Okay. Sorry? I want you to lead me to the climax, not to the end of the plot. Can you tell a story using suspense? Yeah. So do it. You like thriller, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so do it. What are we writing about? Plot. Plot. Did he just swim? A wave came down. Uh, it it no. sent no. him down, and then he found the mainland. No. This is how you're telling the story. Yeah. You're making it really yeah. dull and yeah. ridiculous and boring. This part of it, he lost all, all his breath. He almost died. Yes, and this he, is what I wanted to say. Then he died in the wave. Yeah, okay. Okay. Listen, when we're talking about the plot, we're talking about how the events develop from the conflict to the most dangerous moment. Remember last year when I was teaching you the plot, I gave you the example of Cinderella? Yes. What if Cinderella's mother never died? What if Cinderella's mother remained alive? What if the goal was not direct? Nothing What will happen? Go into the trip, he will arrive to his mainland, everything is okay. Yeah, okay. There is no thriller, there is nothing interesting or exciting to tell. Okay, but if the story begins from a conflict and then becomes more and more complicated until it reaches the climax, now the climax, he said, is the most complicated moment. Yes. The most complicated moment in the plot, okay? And then it starts to resolve until it reaches the end. The part that you will be telling here is the part which is uh, which carries the most of uh, most of the excitement. It is the part in which you are supposed to tell things uh, with thriller, right? Because they get more complicated here. Yes? This is about the time actually working on the post, not to survive. Your text begins from the uh, the uh, the words that the boat was was wrecked, but then he almost died. Why did he almost die? Because of the boat. Which was which of them is most dangerous? Is it the fact that the boat was wrecked, or is it the fact that he was swallowed inside the water and uh, lost breath and he even lost control of himself? Which one of them is the most the dangerous? Well, the second one. Okay, so I want you to tell me how things developed from a wrecked ship until a, uh, the moment in which you almost lost breath. No. 
I should be talking about romanticism in 10 minutes. So, all right. I, I'll, I'll just do like you. You're doing this. <laughs> I'm waiting for my plot. A ship broke. Uh huh. Then, uh, uh, after uh, when the ship uh, was, was broken, uh, Robinson Eden and his companion were thrown uh, into the sea. Mm hmm. I wrote, I wrote that already. So uh, all his companions were uh, were um, sink, sink, sink. sunk. Sunk. Yes. Uh, into the water, so the, they all died. So he was the only one who survived. Okay. He tried to figure a way how to how to stay alive. Okay. How to find some way to stay alive. Mm -hmm. For a moment, uh, when the the wave, the raging wave swallowed him. Uh, he lost his breath. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's see the others. He came back uh, out to the surface of the water. All right. Okay, thank you very much, Raja. Let's hear Emilio. Emilio? Okay, Shema? Okay, when uh, their ship uh, wrecked and sunk, uh, he was he said he was a good swimmer. Still, he, he couldn't save himself from the raging from the raging waves. Uh huh. So yes. he struggled his way back up to mm -hmm. the surface, but the sea kept dragging him down. Very good. Okay, let's write this down. We have here the plot begins when the boat is wrecked and Robinson and his companions are thrown at sea. The plot becomes more complicated as when. It becomes more complicated. Just repeat the things that you said. Yes. As the waves, as the waves became stronger and more violent, and swallowed him. Okay. The plot reaches the climax when. Check if the, if everyone has signed. Okay. Yes. When he was lost inside the water and lost control of his breath and body. Okay. At this moment, what happened to him? He was almost to die. Okay. Yeah. At this moment, Robinson almost died. Okay. Now I want you to tell me about the uh, resolution, the resolution of the plot. How does the plot resolve? No, sorry. He said the sea drove him back to the shore. Okay. No, but if he if he was a good swimmer, he wasn't survive. Okay. Well, uh, is it because of the sea or because of the because of the sea, because he said, till that wave haven't driven me, or rather carried me, a best way to the shore. Yes. So he was the thrown on the shore. Yes, so he ran. Yes. So it was due to the to the water or to the sea to the waves. The, the water just yes. Yeah. It was actually the water that threw him near the mainland. Yeah. Okay, it was the power of the waves that has thrown him, thrown him nearer to the mainland. Thus, he arrived to uh, he managed to arrive to the mainland. Okay. So the plot resolves when. when Yes, when the waves carried, sorry, carried his body, where? Near, the, Near shore. the shore. And Robinson felt finally safe. Okay, now that was the plot development. This is how you speak of the plot. Okay. Sorry? Yes. The wave, they became the... 
They have seen Yes, you can also see it from that way. That is, the waves were his enemy in the beginning, but then uh, the waves have saved him. Uh, you can actually, you can write so many things if you're going to see it from that, uh, from this perspective. Very good. Um, let's move to the next part of the analysis or the next aspect of the analysis, the theme. What is the theme? Usually when we are speaking of the audience, we're speaking of the people to whom the text is addressed. But then uh, if the text is addressed to a particular audience, what is the theme? What is the message of the author? In this case, where is the theme? The danger. Danger. OK, there is a theme of danger. But what does he say about danger? Please keep your idea. Don't lose it. Don't forget it, I'm saying. Yes? All right, but what is the author saying about danger? Is danger something passionate that we should be doing during our, our entire lives? No. no. What is he saying about danger? We should face it. We're speaking. Yes? Danger, okay. Danger must be faced. Good. And also the, the main and to never be which happens at the last minute. Okay, yes, we will get back to that. Yes, uh, uh, in, in the sake of uh, adventures, the fear must be faced. The danger and fear must be faced. Okay, good. Yes? For me, I think the theme, the theme of hope. The author uh, uh, made struggles to improve the past through many difficult things, but he survived by the end. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is. Okay, very good. So let's, yes. We also have the, the adventure and the, the, the dream of the protagonist, uh -huh. the, the obstacles that we can encounter, uh, encounter uh, when we are in... When we are? When we are? When, yeah, when, when people are in, uh, in the struggle. In struggle, yes, thank you. Yes, Asha? Um, the, the, the person behind the story it's, uh, when he was in his uh, like uh, when he was in his uh, bad moments he, he fight to survive even he was, uh, he was you know? almost died yes. can you repeat that in more organized structure okay thank you about it. here let's speak about the theme very quickly the theme or the themes that are most apparent in this text are those of hope, danger, what else? Survival. 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 What all the theme? There is one more theme that you did not mention. What do we understand? Yes, Mohammed? Uh, did he colonize the sea or did the sea colonize him? There's no Friday in here. <laughs> you have to stick to the text, okay? Stick to the action. Do not think of anything that is not in the action. Yes, Emil? Sorry? Shh. Uh, he was thinking in a religious way, so let's say spirituality. But one more thing about uh, what do you think of nature? nature? Yes, he was in danger because of nature and that he was safe because of nature. Yes. So what is the theme of nature? Duality, man versus nature, that's spark notes. But yes. What else can you say about the theme of nature? What if in your in the exam you are uh, asked to speak about the theme of nature in the novel uh, The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe? You can have a topic like this. How, how Robinson Crusoe survived by the nature? You have to explain that in 20 lines. So you have given me one line. I need 19 more lines. Yeah. yeah, I want them to come now. Yes? 
the theme of yeah the theme of nature how nature can play a, a role in this one second, please. Yes. Uh, can you repeat your idea? How nature plays uh, its role in our lives. Okay, the role of nature in our lives. Yes. Uh, how? Uh... <laughs> oh, I'm going to get back to you. All right. Okay. So let's say nature, or let's say in more precise words, the power of nature, okay? It's the, the power of nature which is reflected in the text. So we got here, here, the themes that are most apparent in the text are those of hope, danger, survival, spirituality, and nature, okay? And then you should be explaining them one by one, okay? So the theme of hope is embedded in the fact that uh Amila, i think you are the one who spoke of hope yes uh, can you explain the theme of hope in one sentence give me the sentence that i should put okay so the theme of hope is embedded in the fact that robinson was led to fight for his survival, sorry, for his survival, and or for, fight for his life, and survive at the end, okay? One more theme, uh, the next theme was that of danger. Um, I think, Raja, you were the one who gave danger, or was it non Buddha? Okay, tell me about the theme of danger. The danger of nature. No, he was going, he thought that he was going to die. Okay, let's put them together, okay? The themes of danger and the power, sorry. The themes of nature and danger can be discussed together, yes? How do we see them? In the fact that the way that he swallowed him at the first, then the uh, then the carry can they yes that nature has shown its power. Okay, in the fact that nature has shown its power uh, first in let's say I'm not going to say killing him in torturing torturing him, then in Saving him. Yes? Yes? Even when he was in the island? Yes. Yes, very good. Nature was useful to Robinson. Yes? Even when he was in the mainland. In the mainland. Okay, now there are so many other things that we can say about the themes, but I'm going to stop here due to the time. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I, I had to to do this today just to uh, to train you or to show you how to uh, to speak or how to write a literary analysis because it's very important that you start doing this. Um, you're going to have to write your own literary analysis in the next text that we're going to deal with. Today we're going to speak of Romanticism as a literary movement. Next time in the online session we're going to speak of uh, poetry. We're going to analyze some romantic poems. And then uh, in, uh, in two weeks or in three weeks, that is during our next uh, meeting here, we're going to speak of the novel Frankenstein. So. But in the, uh, when we deal with the novel Frankenstein, we're going to analyze it together in class. But that's also going to be your homework. That is, you are going to bring the analysis of Frankenstein with you. I'm going to collect the analysis of Frankenstein in our next meeting here. Okay? So it's very important that you grasp. Yes, it's very important that you grasp uh, the uh, the uh, the um, 
the uh, the method of the chair analysis and that you know how to write a, an essay so that you are able to do it on your own uh, for the homework. OK, fine. Yes. Yes, for this semester we're only dealing with uh, with realism and romanticism. Yes. Sorry. Are we obliged to write many lines for each theme? For each theme? If it's the exam, yes. For each theme? Not each theme. Uh, for example, in the exam, I can say uh, in what in the life and adventures of Robinson Crusoe, two main themes are very apparent: that of nature and that of the inner self. Explain. So you will have to speak about how the author exposes the inner self of the protagonist and how nature is also, uh, or uh, what is the role of nature and the function of nature in the development of events. All that has to be explained in 20 lines, okay? But 20 lines is really nothing, you know? 20 lines is just half of a page. Uh, I, usually I get up to four pages in an exam, okay? So 20 lines may sound to you scary, but it's really not that scary. Okay, let's move on because we cannot waste more time. Let's speak about the point of view. Remember how to talk about the point of view? It's not, it's not in the beginning. Without mentioning that uh, you are talking. <laughs> I said what is the point of view, not what is not the, the point of view. And this is the main thing I mean when I say point of view. Okay. All right, the point of view or the text is narrated from first person or third person point of view? First person. First person, first person. very good, okay? From a first person point of view, why? Who is speaking? Robinson Crusoe. Okay, Robinson Crusoe, and who is he speaking about? About himself, okay? Because the narrator, Robinson, is speaking of the events that happened to him directly, okay? Now, is it central or peripheral? Is the point of view central or peripheral in the text? Why peripheral? Who said peripheral? Central, because the narrator is the protagonist. Okay. Let's see those who say peripheral. Why peripheral? I know who said it. I'm just acting <laughs> like it. <laughs> okay, it's central, right? It's not peripheral. The, uh, the point of view is peripheral if the speaker is speaking about himself, but yeah. he is not the protagonist. But in this case, we have Robinson Crusoe speaking about himself, but Robinson is also a protagonist, which is why the point of view is also central, okay? It is central because Robinson, sorry, because Ro Robinson is the protagonist. OK, uh, I guess so far we have spoken of the main uh, complicated elements of the analysis. We can now start talking about the literary devices. Can you tell me about the register? What do you think of the register? Register, we said, is the choice of words in the text. What do you think of the choice of words in the text? Here's the text. I'm going to open the text again. What do you think of the choice of words in the text? Uh, the formal, informal, yes, religious. So if it's religious, it is also formal. formal. Very good. Okay. How about the diction? Is it Latin origin or Anglo-Saxon origin? Latin origin. Why? Yes. Now, it is religious and formal because he uses words like salvation and, um, okay, salvation. I will stop here. Is it Latin origin or Anglo-Saxon origin? Yes? The diction is Latin origin or Anglo-Saxon? Okay, why? Give me words that I didn't provide in my video. Okay. 
Now, you recognize a text or you will recognize the diction of a text uh, if it's if the words also exist in other Latin languages. OK, you will recognize a text if the audience or if the language also exists in other languages like Spanish, like French, Italian and so on. OK, and the Anglo-Saxon origin words are words uh, that are also uh, that exist in Germanic languages. OK, uh, merely those of the Anglo-Saxon Saxons, but also uh, of German. Okay. Or simply the, the words that are not of a Latin origin. OK, so the diction in this case is of a Latin origin. All right. The diction is of a Latin origin uh, because he uses he uses words like courage. courage very good. What else? Moment. Furious. Moment. Joyful moment and so on. Okay. Now, can you give me any figures of speech? Yes. Yes. Haven't driven me. Okay. What is that? Yes. There is a personification in the sentence. The wave having driven me. Which means, what does it mean? What does it mean? Yes, Zainab? Leading. Leading him, that is, it was. Yes. It was taken him. Right. It means that the wave was strong at um moved him. Okay. All the figures of speech, hurry up, please. Yes. Sorry? Oh god. Oh god. Apostrophe. Okay. One second. There is an apostrophe in the expression. Oh God. What did he mean? What does this mean? Yes, to express his call for help. Yes, Emil? Mountain lake? Yes, of course. Okay. There is a simile in mountain, in mountain lake, okay, which means, yes, which means that the wave was so big it was, or it looked like a mountain. All right. Without further wasting more time, let's speak about the tone and the atmosphere. Remember, the tone is the feeling of the author, and the atmosphere is the feeling around the character. So in order to answer questions about these, you should be asking yourself the question, um, if I was the author, what? how do I feel about the characters and about the events? This is to talk about the author. How do you feel about your character and about the events? He was scared and uh, lonely. Sorry? He was scared and lonely. If you are... No, one second. If you are Daniel Defoe, if you are the character, uh, if you are the author, are you scared? No. no. This is when he was uh, in the sea. Sorry? When he was uh, in the sea. Okay, you didn't understand me. Uh, in a text, you can understand the feelings of the author, not the narrator. Okay, the author who is the one who wrote the text. The narrator is the one who is speaking inside the, the text. Is a okay, yes, the narrator is a character. So, if you were yourself the author, if you are the one who created this text, how do you feel about Robinson? He would be happy. He saved me by the end. 
<laughs> now this sounds like a psychopath, you know. <laughs> he will make him suffer before saving his his life. So it's, it's a very bad, happy person. <laughs> yes, who is talking here? Someone was talking. Yes. Yes, he felt sorry about him. Okay, so the tone includes feelings of pity and sympathy. Can you give me examples of feelings of pity and sympathy? Examples from the text that make you believe that Robinson ex uh, actually feels that way. Ah, uh, Mr. Robinson, default, feels that way. Any expression or event or word Anything that will make you think that he actually feels pity. It doesn't ha necessarily have to be a sentence from the text. It can be uh, your own thought or an event, something that happened in the text. Here's the text again. How he said that after he lost hope in a survivor. Who is speaking? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the tone includes feelings of pity and sympathy, uh, which are felt when default. Yes, he said. He saved him after they lost Robinson. Yes, saved Robinson after he had lost. Sorry, he had lost hope in survival. Okay, one more feeling for the tone. No more? Okay, let's speak of the atmosphere. Now, for the atmosphere, you have to think of yourself as a character. If you were Robinson Crusoe, how do you feel things around you? If you were yourself, Robinson, and you are drowning in the sea, how do you feel? Confused. Scared. Scared. Terrified. Lost. Okay, that's that. This is the end of my life. Okay, so the atmosphere. Two feelings of fear. What else? Confusion, terror. What else did you say? Loneliness. Loss. Emma, you said. Because that's the my life is over. Okay, so instead of saying convinced, convinced that life is over, can you summarize that in one word? Hopelessness. Yes. Sorry? Okay, hopelessness and weakness. Okay, give me examples. What makes you think that he feels this way? Hurry up. What makes you think that he feels this way? Yes. Nothing can describe the confusion of thought which I felt when I sank into the water. Very good. Okay. He. Uh, this is. Let's say. This is exemplified in his line. Can you give me the line again? All right. Uh, nothing can describe. Describe. The confusion of thought. The confusion of thought. Which I felt. Sorry, which I felt yes. when I sank into the water. When I sank into the water. Okay, thank you very much. All right, now we can conclude. Can you give me a conclusion? In the introduction. This excerpt is taken from the realist adventure novel entitled The Life and Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, written by Daniel Defoe. The uh, realist adventure novel, that's the literary, the literary genre. Okay? Now, now uh, I mentioned it in the analysis because it is part of the analysis, but I prefer to find it in the introduction rather than as an uh, independent uh, aspect in the analysis. Okay? Yes? yes uh, in the conclusion, we talk about um, the author or the narrator. Anything you want. No, you didn't understand me. Like, uh, Robinson Crusoe is a narrator, but Daniel Defoe is the 
Yes. Yes. Yes, you're free. You can talk about Daniel Z4 as much as you can talk about Robinson Crusoe. The uh, conclusion is open. It is free. OK, you have the right to speak of anything you want in the conclusion. Yes. Yes, you can give your own opinion. Yes. So the conclusion to conclude or finally. In this story, the author is showing that nothing can get can be guessed easily, but we all have to go in no. and okay. survive. Can you say it again? In this novel, the author is saying that nothing can be, can be obtained easily. Easily. But we have to go through and that. This is why I said and that humans, OK, I replaced it but uh, by and that humans and that humans. Yes. Struggle. Yes. Struggle and be good survivors. Sorry and be good survivors. And that humans must struggle for survival. Must. Struggle for survival. But if you see here, I only have one line in the conclusion. That's not enough. I, I need more for the conclusion. Can you give me more ideas for the conclusion? Uh, you're free. If you want to speak of the entire novel, you can say in this novel. But if you are going to speak only of the content of the extract, so you are going to say in this excerpt. OK, so it depends on what you are going to say. Uh, for example, you don't say in this excerpt slavery is a bad thing while there is no slavery in the excerpt. OK, so you have to, uh, to if you're going to speak of the excerpt, you're going to stick to the excerpt. If you, but if you're going to speak of the novel, you're free. OK, so uh, can you give me something to add to the conclusion? Faria, please. Yes, you could say uh, that the writer is going to be the author of Daniel Dickens represents Robinson Crusoe as a character that never gave up, like represents the courage, uh, being patient, uh, like hopeful. Okay, so Robinson was um, depicted as never gives up. as a person who never gives up. Yes, a symbol about courage. A uh, symbol of courage. Uh, and and, uh... Let's stop here. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. So now we have finished the analysis of Robinson Crusoe. I'm going to save uh, this document and I'm going to share it with you on Teams. This is going to be a sample essay for you. All right, sample essay analysis. You're going to find it in the file section. Okay, so you can go back to the document and you're going to find it on Teams. This document is going to serve you as a sample essay to follow for your future experiences. All right, now I want you to open the, uh, the uh, romanticism, the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. I am still keeping the meeting here so you can follow me either on the meeting or in your personal files, okay? I'm going to switch now to romanticism. I lost my presentation. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere here. Yes. OK. Are you coming back? Yeah. Well, you better be really quick because this is very important. Thank you. 
Now, please tell me. about is going to be romanticism. Now, romanticism is a movement different which we have seen before. What? The first thing you should know about romanticism is that the authors were somehow embittered with the rational thinking and the rational uh, obligations they had to go to. Okay? Remember that when we were talking about the age of reason and rationalism, I made it on purpose to emphasize the idea that logic was the only thing acceptable in society and that a man could not or any of it is not able or allowed to think in anything else if it's not logical okay now things have become more serious in society like society did not accept anything that is emotional or spiritual or supernatural anymore they considered all these things as being superstitious and irrational, and thus anything irrational should not be favored or encouraged. To give you an example, in society, it has become a normal thing to prefer a marriage, for example, a rational marriage or to marry someone who is rich rather than marrying someone you love because you love them. Okay, and anyone who prefers to love so, to marry someone they love were considered as irrational. Okay, so it has become a very normal thing, or it has become the right thing to do to choose rationality even in marriage or in relationships. So life has started to become devoid of feelings and devoid of emotion. The same thing happened in literature. In, the, in literature and in the arts, uh, artists were no longer allowed to speak of, rational, of, of, of emotion or of sensitivity. Okay, uh, there is the artists were uh, were obliged to avoid any form of fantasy, of imagination, of the supernatural, and to stick to things that are realistic. And this was, of course, the uh, the birth of uh, of realism, and then the birth of the novel, as we have explained before. If you remember, we said that the novel was born because the authors had to write rational. They had to write rational things that were also realistic and that were easy to read, and so on. Okay. Now, the authors, after one century, are embittered with these uh, obligations, with the obligation, obligations that, that were imposed on them in literature. They didn't want to write something realistic anymore. They wanted to explore their imagination. For them, imagination was a freedom. It is a revolution. This is why they came up with the Romantic Revolution. So, when we are speaking of romanticism, we are not speaking of love stories. Okay? We're not speaking of the Romeo and Juliet uh, romance, but we are rather speaking of things of, of, of the literature and then art that is based on fantasy, on imagination as a form of freedom. It is referred to as romanticism because it, 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 it is based on feelings and on, on, on emotion, on sensitivity and on imagination. By feelings, again, I don't necessarily mean love stories, but it's the fact that literature would come up from the inner self, from intuition, rather than from rationality and from society. What medicine does is that it opposes two main forces that are usually opposed in society. It opposes rationality on the one side and the inner self, intuition, uh, uh, to society. Romanticism thinks that society is a form or the source of corruption. Why corruption? Society will not let you think for yourself. Society will always oblige you to think like they think. 
society will always oblige you to dress like they want you to dress, okay? But if you are going to think from the inner self, if you are going to follow the inner self, you are going to think intuitively, okay? Intuitive, intuitively, sorry. That is, you are going to follow your intuition. And this is what Romanticism is actually about. All right? The authors will be writing uh, or will be inspiring from their inner self, from the intuition. Okay? They will be inspiring from the inner self. And they will consider society as a form of corruption. Society uh, is not considered as a bad thing, but it is considered as a, a power that is exercised over the individual and that deprives the individual from being free, from thinking free. Okay? All of these things have been uh, embodied or have been represented in, in a literature that was more or less emotional, that was inspired from the inner self, and that was individualistic. Now, individualism is a key word in Romanticism, okay? Individualism. What do I mean by individualism? Individualism is the idea that man can inspire things from, from his own self, from the deep self, rather than from society. Whether you want to think of your life, whether it's a lifestyle, whether it's your inner class, or the way you are addressing the people around you, it is the fact of inspiring only from the self and being entirely subjective. Okay? Romanticism is about subjectivity, it is not about objectivity, it is not about society. So if someone is individualistic, they are entirely subjective. Okay? So individualism is the fact of bringing one's ideas and thinking uh, from one's intuition and from the inner self. Not caring about society and not, not considering society as, uh, as, a, uh, as the source. Society is no longer the source. It is the inner self which is the source of inspiration. Okay? Yes. So, Romanticism is, before everything else, is a revolution. Okay? Romanticism is a revolution. It was a revolution that was led by philosophers and by artists to recover uh, back the past that was the simple past and to recover feelings, to recover the freedom of exploring feeling and imagination. Now, I mentioned the past and I said it's an attempt to recover the past. Why the past? Now, the Romantics were bothered by rationality, okay? They were bothered by technology and by industrialization. They thought that technology and industrialization, as well as the uh, ideology of rationality, were uh, impulsive and that they were depriving the human beings from being free. And uh, they, they, they thought that the world was a better place before rationalism. So they neglected and rejected anything that is, uh, uh, that is related to, uh, to, to rationality. This also included industrialization and technology. Okay? They were also bothered because industrialization had obliged children to work and they were against child labor. Yes, they thought that child labor killed child with innocence, that the children were, uh, were losing their innocence, they were losing their spontaneity and their genius. And thus, children were growing up as machines, as machines that were, that were unable to think, nor able to feel due to industrialization. So the biggest enemy of the romantics was rationalism and industrialization. This is why they wanted to go back to the past. Which past? It is the primitive past that existed before rationalism. Okay? Thus, in literature, too, they wanted to go back to the past. Since rationalism brought the noble, and I want to end everything that is related to, the, uh, to rationalism, so automatically I am not going to write the novel, right? Yeah. Sorry, Peter? Okay, so if I'm not going to write the novel, what am I going to write? So it's a poem. Yes, who said poem? Yes, very good. Poetry was the form of writing that existed before the novel. 
Okay, so if the other is breaking with everything industrial, everything rational, they are also breaking with the form of literature that came up because of rationalism, which is the normal. Okay, this is why in their nostalgia for the past or in their attempt to go back to the past, they also went, uh, went back to the primitive uh, uh, past or they also went back to poetry as the primitive form of writing. Okay that of the past. Now, I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation with you. Um, I don't know if I can... Let me see this. Yes, uh, do you see it full screen? I'm trying to... It's not shared anymore. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can... Uh, I have to share it full screen so just so that you can see it because it's very important that you see everything in here. This was the wrong presentation. Now, do you see it full screen? Do you see something? Anyway. I'm just going to share it directly from my computer. I'm going to discover the, the tools of Teams later. Now, do you see it? Yeah. Yes. You have to. <laughs> okay. So basic, the basic thing we're going to speak about, or the first thing we're going to speak about, are the key concepts. Now, if you have the presentation that I have already uploaded to you, uh, go directly to page two, okay? If you are not following the presentation on Teams, uh, if you have already downloaded the PowerPoints that I gave you on Teams and on Facebook, open the PowerPoint and go directly to page two. Key concepts. Did you find it, everyone? Yeah. All right. So in the key concepts here, you have the key concepts or the key uh, ideas of uh, the uh, of romanticism. The first one is sensibility. As I said, the romantics were fed up with everything that is rational. They would not want to be rational anymore. They wanted to go back to everything that is sensitive and emotional. So sensitivity is a, a, a key point or a key idea in here. Second one is innocence. The romantics thought that the inner self is innocent and that if you are going to follow your inner ideas, your intuition and your feelings and your inner self, you are going to be more innocent. Why? If you're going to follow society, society will transform you into a bad person. Okay? Yes, a corrupt person. The next one is imagination. Imagination is a, a is a, a richness or a wealth to be explored by the romantics, which I will explain later. Inspiration. Uh, inspiration is related to the idea of imagination. If you have ima imagination, you are an inspired person. Individuality is the idea that I have explained before. That is, uh, man is the center of the universe and all your personal ideas and indiv individual ideas are very important. They are more important than those of society. Idealism is also a, 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 an, an important idea. Now, for the romantics, it was thought that idealism, or it was thought that the world must be led in an idealist way. That is, they thought that their ideas were going to lead to the to a better world or to a utopia. Okay, so they thought that their ideas were the ideas that were going to lead to a peaceful, very beautiful world or utopia. Okay, intuition as a next uh, idea, now, which I have explained before, that you can find the best ideas inside yourself. Nature. Nature is very important for the romantics. Nature actually represents the refuge of the romantics. That is, uh, romantics find their peace and their escape in nature. If they don't want to, to have any recourse to society anymore, if they want to escape society, the trouble of society, the uh, impositions, the obligations of society, the romantics will escape to nature. Okay, 
Uh, next, the freedom from tradition. As I said before, the rom romanticism is a revolution. Okay, romanticism is a revolution against uh, structured rules of society. It is also a, a, a revolution against rationalism. So what is meant by tradition here is both the ideology of rationalism, but also the rules that are imposed by society. Okay, you have to think of romanticism as a revolution. All right, next uh, slide. Now, the, uh, these are the main influences or the main drives that have led to the rise of the uh, of the uh, of romanticism as a philosophy. Now, romanticism appeared for the first time in Spain and in France. Okay, the earliest uh, ideas of of romanticism appeared with the French philosopher Denis Diderot, who who was actually a, a an enlightenment philosopher. Okay, Denis Diderot was a rational philosopher, but he came up with an idea that later became. An, an inspiration to the romantics. So then he always said the future is built on reason, but man is born to think for himself. And it is this idea that man is born to think for himself that was later translated into a, a personal freedom by the romantics. This is one. Now, uh, the second idea by the, by by the, 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 the now are you going to stop messenger there I can see it in your eyes just because I am teaching doesn't mean that I cannot see you <laughs> okay so uh, I wanted to follow here because this is very important the idea of Denis Diderot or one more revolutionary idea by Denis Diderot is that he wrote the encyclopedia he wrote the first encyclopedia in the history of humanity and in his encyclopedia for the first time he introduced the term middle class while in earlier or in his age only the upper class and the aristocracies were actually represented in any form of literature philosophy or else okay so it was important or, or rather it was new that uh, the middle class is introduced in this encyclopedia and for the very same reason that is because he spoke of the middle class he was put in jail for a while okay so then you see all led uh, in the uh, or was a leading figure in the in, in inspiring the uh, romantics particularly for uh, the revolution because by shedding light on the middle class while the aristocracies only wanted to talk about themselves this in itself was an act of revolution it was an act of transgression he did something that society or that the upper class didn't want okay he did something that was against the rules so it was the first act of revolution his works were banned by the government and the second uh, the second uh, influencer uh, was uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who favored feeling over thought. He said, to feel is to exist. We feel before we start thinking about things. Now, the idea of Jean-Jacques Rousseau here is meant to emphasize the idea of intuition or the inner self that we, we find the best, uh, the best decisions or the best ideas inside ourselves. We find the best decisions inside ourselves, okay? So it's feeling before thinking. We think in terms of society. Our thinking is influenced by society. Our thinking is influenced by the things that surround us, by our culture, by, by philosophy. But our feelings are natural, innocent, and, and, uh, and uh, pure, okay? This is why he's uh, emphasizing feeling over uh, thinking and he says to feel is to exist as opposed to the uh, Descartes uh, idea uh, or I Descartes so uh, I thought yes I, I think thus I exist okay so Descartes was a rational philosopher this is why he he he, uh, he kind of placed the idea of existing with the idea of thinking okay but what Jean-Jacques Rousseau sa said is that you don't exist just because you think you you exist if you feel if you don't feel you don't exist okay so the next idea or the next uh, influence was the American Revolution now the American Revolution inspired new ideas of equality and liberty in Europe all right and that's because uh, the political uh, things and the political um, 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 uh, conditions in Europe was re were really bad during the period actually this period has witnessed many political revolutions merely that of the French uh, and the French Revolution was a basic uh, influence for the rise of romances 
and also for the for the British later. And then uh, many political revolutions have occurred in Britain uh, through time. So a revolution, the political revolutions, and uh, uh, both the French Revolution and the American Revolution were a direct influence for the Romantics. Okay, are you following that? Yeah. Okay, great. Next slide, please. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, both Diderot and Rousseau, believed that control and authority are repressive and thought that man needs freedom, okay? Basically, the Romantics have rejected society because they thought that society was imposing rules on human beings, okay? So this is why they have rejected all forms of authority and they have rejected all forms of control because they thought they would not leave human beings uh, feeling free. Against all forms of control and power, be it in society or in government. But if you are going to think, yes, if you're going to think about it, you find that even society is a form of power. Society is exercising power over individuals and thus individuals do not have the freedom to be themselves in society. Okay? But, uh, they were uh, with the authors or against them? Look, uh, there are many uh, authors or many romantic authors. There have been two main waves. There is what we call the first generation and the second generation. While the first generation was trying to lead a political revolution and they started teaching things related to uh, civil rights, to citizenship and, and freedom, the second generation was more related or concerned itself more with society. By being individualistic and by breaking the rules of society, they were telling society that their rules were bad and they were not going to conform to them. Okay, like so there have been Lansing. different. Sorry. Like George Lansing. Uh, we live in Algeria, yes. Well, um, I, I will hear since I am more familiar with British literature. Uh, we're going to see some figures uh, as I move on with the presentation. Okay. Now. Uh, the next idea is that Rousseau said man was born free, but everywhere he is in chains. OK, man is born free as human beings who are born free, but everywhere in society we are in chains. OK, you will go to school, they will teach you how to act. You will go to society, they will uh, teach you how to act. We, they are going to teach you how to speak, how to behave, how to think and so on. Yes. Sorry. To the mainstream culture, okay, and this is what the romantics were actually um, um, uh, uh, rebelling against. The next idea by Jean Jacques Rousseau is that the civilized man is born and dies a slave. Why is the civilized man born and dies a slave? The idea is that the civilized man is born a slave and dies a slave is that under civilization, under the power of industrialization, and under the power of rationalism, man has no freedom. He becomes a slave to industrialization. He becomes a slave to, to technology. He becomes a slave to rationalism, and thus he is not free. Okay. Next, man is innately good, but science is wicked, and civilization is harmful, and all cultures are corrupt. Now you understand it. The Romantics were re re rebelling against everything that has been structured and constructed, either by society or by rationalism and they wanted to go back to the past which was free which was spontaneous innocent pure and including no form of rationalism or industrialization okay next uh, call, uh, he called, that is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, called for the end of civilization, saying that nature never deceives us, it is us who deceive ourselves. It is human beings who deceive themselves by accepting to live under the obligations, and that if human beings want to be free, they have to go to nature. Okay, in nature, there is no rationalism, there is no industrialization, there is no technology, there is no society. In only in nature, man can be free. See here that nature is uh, the escape of the romantics. Nature represents the refuge of the romantics. Okay. The next influence is the French Revolution. We have here, uh, it's, uh, it happened in 1780. Uh, it's a political upheaval and, uh, in France and which inspired the dreams of liberty. Now, if you are following on your, uh, uh, in, in your own PowerPoint, so please switch to the next page, okay? Uh, I am in page five. I am in slide five. 
So the French Revolution was a, a political upheaval in France, which inspired the dreams of liberty. Louis XVI was ex executed by the Guillaume in, in 1793, and the French Revolution inspired ideas of freedom, liberty, and liberty to the British. Now, have you seen the film Marie Antoinette? Yes. Yes, uh, Marie Antoinette was the, the wife of Louis the XVI, and uh, while the French people were hungry, uh, she was just spending money and making oh, uh, organizing. Oh, yes, she was parties. organizing parties all the time and so on. And one very famous sentence that was often repeated by historians: that when she, when the people have revolted, they went to the to uh, to the uh, palace uh, of the That's king. Uh, yes, in in order to uh, to uh, to express their anger, she said, "What what is wrong with them?" They said they want bread. So she said, "Yes, they could just." Eat cookies or cakes or else. Okay, so uh, why are they asking for friends? That let, let them eat cakes. All right. So she, uh, her, uh, the the she was captured with the king a few years later, and the king uh, Louis the Sixteenth was executed. Now the French Revolution represented a form of a new hope for the Romantics. Please pay attention here. The French Revolution. Yes. Evil. Revolution. Okay, so the French Revolution represented a new hope for the uh, for the Romantics, and they wanted to make the revolution happen again in uh, in in Britain because they were motivated by the uh, the uh, the uh, the feelings of liberty and of freedom that happened or that started in France after the rule of Louis the Sixteenth. Uh, the thing that they did not expect is that things in France became quite bloody a few years later. After the Jacobians have taken the rule in France, uh, uh, people, uh, they have started killing everyone who was suspected to have, uh, uh, to have been a sympathizer of uh, Louis XVI or of the ancient regime. And thus, things started to get bloody and they went really wrong in France. But the Romantics, although the Romantics were deceived by how bad things uh, have become in France, they were still motivated and ambitious and they still wanted to make the revolution happen in, uh, in Britain. Okay, so slide number six, please. Romanticism revolted against industry, commerce, rationality, science, and the new technology-oriented world. So you know it now. The Romantics were re rebelling against everything that has been constructed by human beings, and they want to go back to nature because nature represents freedom, spontaneity, purity, and innocence. Okay? Uh, nature is not corrupted by the hand of human beings. Okay? Next. Uh, they revolted against the repressive organized lifestyle of the modern world and they wanted to be just free. Their revolution was against authority and hierarchy. Next slide, yes. Okay, next slide. Yes, the major figures. Now, there are two main generations in Romanticism, but these two generations uh, have lived in the same time. Even though we say two generations, it's because there are two different movements that occurred within Romances, but both of them have appeared or have lived within the same time period. Okay? So the first generation, as I said before, have concerned themselves with the political revolution and they wanted to make a political revolution happen in England. Okay? They are William Blake, William Wordsworth, and Samuel Richardson. Uh, sorry, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, the second uh, generation were concerned themselves with society and with individualism. They were more free in a philosophical way. We are going to see them later. Now, uh, the uh, still within the first generation, they were known as the Lake Poets because they grew up in Lake District. They were against change and wanted a return to poetry, as I, uh, as I explained before, since they want to end up with everything that is rational they want to break with everything that is rational and uh, uh, that is related to industrialization 
they want to go back to poetry in literature. Uh, they want to go back to imagination and the legend. They had the nostalgia for the past and they wanted to go back to the mysterious and to the magical. OK, so you see here that imagination is of a great importance for the romantics. All right. They are expressing their revolution against both the politics and society through their imagination by breaking with the things that human beings are familiar with and bring it, bring it, bring in, sorry, something new. Sorry. Yes, by, by, well, by just stopping everything that is rational and bring in something irrational, they are breaking, they are showing their revolution against rationalism. Okay. That is, for example, if I want to show that I disagree with everything that is logical, I am against the philosophy of logic. I am going to act like, uh, or I'm going to make you believe that I see a, I think I've spoken of the blue creature before. Yes. I spoke no. of the blue creature. No. Well, there is a blue creature that is sitting right here. Okay. And the blue creature is helping me with my class. Why are you laughing? It is here. All right. So I am here challenging rationality by doing something entirely irrational, which is the product of my imagination. And this is what the romantics were doing. Okay, the romantics were challenging rationality by breaking with everything rational and bringing something supernatural. The supernatural, the imaginary, the fantasy represented freedom. Okay, next slide. Uh, the second generation romantics, I am here in slide number eight. Okay, second generation romantics, they are John Keats, Percy B. Shelley, and Lord Byron. They defied society, the standards of society, they revolted against and transgressed the law. To transgress is to go beyond. Okay, they defied society, they were against society and the social norms, and they just wanted to go beyond. They sought to give meaning to life. They were constantly in search for the meaning of life. They wanted to find the meaning of life in experiences that were new, different, and exotic. They rejected the rational lifestyle in which they were, and they wanted to discover something different, something new. This is why they were particularly uh, interested in exotic experiences. Yes, Sasha? In here, uh, published uh, his wife's story over French time. Later, okay? We're going to talk about that later. Now, they were self-sufficient and individualistic. Uh, individualism is an idea that I have explained before. It's the idea that you can survive on your own. Man can survive uh, in entire isolation, that your own ideas, your personal ideas, uh, inspired from the inner self are the ideas you should be living by. Their poetry was self-regarding and subjective. That is, in their poetry, they were very subjective. They were talking about themselves. They were praising themselves. Okay, you can think of themselves of, of them as very selfish, and they were very selfish. Okay, they were. Okay, yeah, the, but the second generation romantics were just praising themselves. They were just constantly dissatisfied, never satisfied with anything. And they made the other people work hard to, to make them satisfied. They were enveloped in passion, emotion, incorporating so much more into intuitive thought, the supernatural and the exotic. One thing you should know about the, the second generation romantics is that they were very emotional. Okay, they were very sensitive and very emotional. Next slide, uh, slide number nine. Now, this is uh, something about uh, Van Gogh. I'm not going to speak about it, but you can read this slide later. He was one of the early writers of romanticism, but he was a German uh, writer. Uh, next slide, 10. William Blake. Now, William Blake sought imagination. He thought that imagination is the source of art. One thing you should know about William Blake is that he was among, uh, or rather, he was against child labor, and he thought that children were deprived of, of their innocence and spontaneity when they were obliged to work. So he wrote uh, the uh, the uh, the um, he wrote the chimney sweeper, which is a poem in which uh, children had to clean a chimney and then they were uh, it, it speaks uh, with, it, it emotionally about the trouble of sending children to work in such cold okay uh, can i have the attendance sheet please attendance sheet have you all signed the attendance sheet did everyone sign sure okay
So he sought imagination. He thought that imagination is the source of art. He sought freedom and thought that the system enslaved him. This is the same uh, idea as that of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that the system was enslaving man when obliging man to live uh, uh, under rationality. He chose poetry and painting to express his uncommon ideas. That is, he expressed himself in uh, poetry and painting, and he thought that life is a prison and free will and imagination are locked out of imposed systems. I repeat, life is a prison and free will and imagination are locked out of the imposed systems. That is the imposed system, the system that is imposed on us, be it on society, in society, culture, or in politics, does not include any imagination and thus it does not include any freedom. In the back, hello, how are you? Wake up, please. Yes? Yes. Now, next slide, 11. Blake and Wordsworth had a grief for children who had to work, as I have explained before. They thought that spontaneous childhood visions are the source of adult inspiration. I repeat, childhood, uh, spontaneous childhood visions are the source of adult inspiration, and thus innocence is a source of creativity and genius. Let me give you an example to explain this idea very quickly. When I was young, when I was a child, uh, I, uh, you know, I live in a, I, I live in a seaside city, and by going uh, to, uh, to to school each morning, we had to drive uh, a road uh, from which we could see the shore. And during winter, I would see the high waves and the white foam over the uh, uh, the, uh, the the waves, and I used to think that it was the fish doing the laundry. And uh, my parents also were in, uh, were were kind of encouraging the idea, the the, uh, the imagination uh, in my brain. Okay, so this is a childhood vision. All right, that is childhood visions are a product of imagination of spontaneity and of innocence and i'm sure you all have stories like this uh, we thought that uh well, i thought that god was walking in the sky to an opening taps and that's why we had water uh, we had uh, uh rain okay so these childhood visions are the product of imagination they are thus the product of spontaneity purity and innocence but yes these, yes, of creativity, thank you. But if the children are obliged to go to work at a young age, they are deprived of these visions and thus they become uh, uninspired or they turn into corrupted adults, okay? So here, uh, this is why it's meant here by the spontaneous childhood visions are the source of adult inspiration. Innocence is a source of creativity and genius. At the same time, rationality is a source of corruption. Adult life is a source of corruption. Okay, next slide. Uh, Wordsworth, William Wordsworth is the author of I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. Remember that poem? I think we did, uh, we did this poem last year, didn't we? No? no? Okay, sorry. Now, William Wordsworth wanted to make the revolution happen in England, okay? Uh, I will try to find, uh, to go through the uh, most important points. Uh, he, he, he uh, actually, William Wordsworth was married uh, in Paris. He had a wife in Paris. And then uh, when the, the war started or the war broke between England and France, he had to leave Paris and he had to abandon his wife and daughter there and he had never seen them again. So he was kind of uh, embittered and he was broken, heartbroken. He was deceived by human beings. This is why he became a wanderer in nature. When I say wonder, not wonder, okay? Wonder in nature, that is, he was walking in nature. And by wandering in nature, by spending so much time in nature, he has met people who were not influenced by industrialization and who were not influenced by rationality. And that's where he regained his belief in human beings, okay? But, and this is why I will ask you here to look at the last idea in the slide. Landscape restored his faith in human nature. That is by walking in nature, in the landscape, by walking in nature, by discovering the goodness of the people who lived in nature and who were not influenced by society, by life in the city, by rationalism and so on. He started to believe again in human nature. Okay, next slide. Uh, 
this is a uh, well, these are the things that both um, Coleridge and William Wordsworth were doing in England in, in order to uh, to to make the revolution happen. Uh, here, I want you to focus on how um, or, or, on on the idea of the lyrical ballads. Where is it? Yes. You see the second column, the column which is on the right. In Bristol, he wrote poetry with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Now, both William Wordsworth and Coleridge wanted to make the revolution happen in England. Listen, I am going. I, I am being a little fast here, but I still want you to go back on the ideas that I did not read. You have to read them. You still have to go back over them. Okay, you still have to revise them. All right, you're still concerned with them. So both saved romances from the chaos of the French Revolution through what is known as the Lyrical Ballad. Next slide. The Lyrical Ballad is a book that was written both by William Wordsworth and T.S. Coleridge, uh, in which they explained the basic uh, principles of romanticism. It is referred to as the Bible of romanticism. OK, now. Uh, you will go back over the lyrical ballad later and read this slide because it's very important. I'm not going to spend time on it, but please go back over it and uh, read it. Next, uh, slide number 15, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. to make the revolution happen in England. And he was a great fan of imagination and fantasy, okay? The time of the ancient mariner, in which a voyager shot an albatross and his ship was followed by ghosts. Now, color. In, in the ancient. Uh, do you still see my screen if you are in the team? Are you in the meeting? Okay, anyway. Uh, he, he wrote the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which is a gothic poem, okay? So one thing you should know about romanticism is that it also featured the beginning of a new uh, genre or a, a, a new stream, which is gothicism. So the romantics wrote two kinds of romanticism. Uh, the uh, One sort of a optimist romanticism, which is about revolution, like the works of uh, William Wordsworth, William Blake, and so on. But Coleridge wrought different types of romanticism, among which gothicism. So gothicism is a pessimist romanticism, okay? Gothicism is a pessimist romanticism. In the rhyme of the ancient mariner, we have a poem about a mariner, a, a seafarer who shot an albatross while traveling by sea. Uh, the albatross is a seabird, okay? And because he shot the albatross, nature decided to take its revenge. So his ship was followed by ghosts for the entire night, okay? And at the end, he has realized that he should not hurt nature. Next, uh, through his poem, The Search of Freedom Has Led the Romantics to the Natural World, uh, he explored, next slide, slide number 16, uh, Coleridge explored the limits of human imagination which inspired him, Kubla Khan, which is the best experience, which is an experience of the exotic. Now, Kubla Khan is a work that he wrought under the effect of drug. That is, he thought that imagination had to he couldn't he couldn't explore his imagination while being sober so what he did is that he was taking drugs to explore his imagination and indeed he wrote the best of his works while under the effect of drug okay yes by taking up you by because he thought that uh, rationality was depriving him from exploring uh, imagination and he thought that imagination or the mind was a mystery okay read here uh, the second point for Coleridge, mind is a mystery discovered through imagination. That imagination was really rich and it had to be discovered. Next slide, John Keats. Now, John Keats is the first author in the second generation uh, poets. And as I said before, uh, uh, the second generation poets were rather sensitive and they were challenging society rather than challenging politics, okay? So he experienced the horror of conducting surgery on human bodies without anesthesis. 
Now, one thing you should know about junk kids is that junk kids is a very sensitive and a very uh, emotional board. Okay. When I said this, uh, please. When I said this to uh, to one of our teachers here, I told her there's something about junk kids that says that he was operating, he was cutting open human bodies without giving them anesthesis in order to see how they experience pain. She said, no, that's impossible. John Keats is the master of sensitivity. He was the master of emotion. He cannot do that. Well, apparently he did. OK, so the reason why he did this is that he thought that poetry can be medicine. He thought that words are medicine. Poetry is a medicine and that he can heal human beings using words. So instead in. in, uh, in I'm sorry. Uh, in order, sorry, in order to find or in order to understand how human beings feel uh, pain or rather in order to write the best words that can heal human beings, what John Keats did, did is that he made them suffer and he was observing their pain, he was observing their suffering and translated it into words and that's how he managed to write a poetry good enough to be able to heal human beings that are suffering. Okay, next slide. Percy P. Shelley. Now Shelley was quite um, self-regarding and uh, emotional and individualistic. Okay, now he sought the meaning of life and claimed that it was found in atheism. So he didn't really believe in God. He thought that he has to, to think uh, beyond the idea of God and the idea of religion to find the true meaning of life. He had different love affairs and sought self-gratification. By violating social conventions, Shelley pioneered in a notion of free love. He created what is known as free love. And in free love, he was actually having endless uh, love relationships with endless numbers of women, considering that he had the freedom of loving a new woman each day. Okay. <laughs> he is uh, a form of inspiration. So he was already married and. Uh, I don't know. I didn't live at that time. Okay. So he was vit visiting William Godwin, and William Godwin was uh, actually uh, the, the husband of uh, Mary Wollstonecraft. What Mary Wollstonecraft was a scholar. She was the first feminist in uh, in the Western world. She was the first woman to speak of the rights of women. Now, their daughter, uh, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft Godwin, she was also named Mary, later became Mary Shelley. OK, so Shelley was visiting uh, William Godwin to learn about politics and philosophy. He was learning from him uh, politics and philosophy, and that's where he met Mary Shelley. Later, they escaped together to Switzerland, uh, and when he heard that his wife had committed suicide, he married Mary. OK, <laughs> now next author is uh, Lord Byron. Yes, Mary Shelley is the author of Frankenstein. This is not a, but uh, he published published the story under the yes actually many uh please stop talking many critics think that she's not the one who wrote the story that it was him who wrote the story but because he has heard her so many times he he he, he said that it was her uh many teachers in this department still think uh that he is the one who wrote frankenstein but i think that she is the one who did not him but anyway uh, let's move to the next slide. Slide number 19, please. Lord Byron, the great object of life for Lord Byron is sensation. That is, for Lord Byron, everything must be related to sensitivity. Actually, I advise you to watch the film, Mary Shelley. It's a film that was released in uh, 2019, I think. Uh, it's an interesting film. You should watch it, okay? Uh, you're going to see uh, Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron in the film, okay? So uh, he wrote a poetry about sensitivity, and he was particularly, please your attention, I have to finish this. Uh, he was particularly 
interested in exotic and extremely sensitive experiences. Okay, this is why Lord Byron was particularly interested in Indian cultures, Arab cultures, and uh, African cultures, which he considered as exotic, as something different and supernatural. Okay, see that they were considering the Arabs and the Asians as supernatural, and this is why he was trying to discover them. He thought that they were different and he wanted to discover them. Next, Mary Shelley, slide number 20. Now, she was a poet and novelist, daughter of feminists Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. Yes? Daughter of philosopher. Yes, philosopher and politician. Okay? Philosopher and feminist Mary Wollstonecraft and her husband, politician also, and philosopher um, 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 uh, William Godwin. Okay? She was Frankenstein or modern Prometheus. Uh, and she uh, she was she is considered as the earliest figure uh, in Gothic literature, also cons uh, considered sometimes as the master or the first author of science fiction. OK, but science fiction as a term was only used in the 1920s. This is why I don't want you to speak about science fiction here. Plus, uh, Fra Frankenstein to me is more of a Gothic. Uh, 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 yes, it's more of a Gothic novel than a science fiction novel, because science fiction novel does not include much horror and uh, and Gothicism, but it includes the aspects of the disgust, the supernatural things that are different, uh, the weird, but but also some insane and madness, okay? There's also some madness in science fiction, which is not uh, always uh, uh, existent in the Gothic uh, literature, okay? So she wrote Gothic stories about beasts, supernatural mystery and antiquity, and the fear of the supernatural. Do you know what is meant by antiquity? Yes, antiquity is something that is very old and very archaic. The term Gothic, is itself inspired from the Gauls, which are a very archaic tribe. Okay, next, uh, this is here what we have here in slide 21 an example of Gothic architecture. This is the uh, Hungarian uh, parliament in Budapest, and uh, it's it really has. Uh, the, the, if you are going to look at the at the, uh, at the, at the details, they are really Gothic. You will see things that are truly Gothic. Sorry. Yes, there are many details. Now, finally, conclusion. To conclude, slide 22. There are the five eyes of romanticism. What I mean by eyes, I don't mean eyes, but they are the concepts or the, uh, the, uh, the principles that begin with the letter I. First one is innocence and youth. Youth is not corrupted, thus free from the evils of society. OK, innocence and youth. Childhood innocence is very important. Why? It is not corrupted by society. Society and adult life are corrupted because human beings as adults have to follow the norms and the rules of society rather than being spontaneous. I am not going to forgive you if you make mistakes about this in the exam. OK. Now, imagination a source of information which deserves exploration. For the romantics, imagination is a source of information, okay? Uh, imagination is rich, it is a source of, uh, it is full of information that needs to be explored and that needs to be used. This is why in the example that I gave you, I have invented a blue beast here, and the blue beast is very friendly, okay? So imagination is full of interesting things that you can come up with. And imagination is actually uh, a, 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 a path to, to freedom. It is what can lead the human being towards freedom. Uh, the next idea is inspiration by nature. Nature is more valuable than towns and cities. People are free from judgment and from negative influences. All the romantics considered nature as a refuge. They considered nature as an escape. They thought they can find their freedom and their uh, their uh, their spontaneity only in nature. So nature is venerated by the romantics. Some of them even became pantheist. What is known by what is meant by pantheist is someone who uh, who uh, who. Um, worships nature okay a pantheist is someone who worships nature 
Finally, intuition, that is the inner voice. You are going to find inner goodness inside yourself. Society is a form of corruption and individualism, the a divine spark in every human being. Individualism is the idea, as I said before, that you can find the better, the best uh, uh, ideas, the best decisions and the best uh, um, uh, views inside yourself. And that there is also, uh, for the romantics, there is also the idea that there is a divine spark in each human being, which means all human beings are made in the image of God. Okay, they think that the human being is so sacred, so uh, valuable that he has something from God, from the power of God. Okay, so this is all for romanticism. The, the last slide includes some references. Please do not make any noise until I call your names because you need your evaluation grade and then you are free to leave. Okay.